I've already seen all the jokes that were entering in the 20s, right? We're going to have uh, the 20s back. Hallelujah. But it's good to be in the house of God this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Jared. I'm one of the elders here. Uh, and, it, and it's just a, a privilege to be able to speak to you today and, and, and to bring the word to you today. And I, I just, I really believe in my spirit that I have a message that, that will uh, hopefully bring some clarity for us in, in, in the new coming year. And, and uh, I'm just excited to be here. I'm excited to be uh, speaking this morning. Let me find, you see all these notes I got? I got to find my actual message in here. Let's see where it's at. Here it is. Okay. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the building this morning. Let's just, uh, uh, real quick, we, we have some awesome things happen in 2020. We don't have the announcements up, but you'll, you'll start seeing those things next week. We have some uh, things happening uh, in January and also in February. We have a, uh, a conference coming up. Um, just a lot of things that are happening, and, and, and we're super excited about them. Uh, and, and so just be looking for 2020 to be filled with some awesome things happening for the Lord. And also, let's just uh, give thanks for the offering. We have the offering um, little boxes in the back, so uh, don't forget to drop off your offerings. We just thank you for that. We thank you that you're giving to the Lord your tithe and offering. Amen. Hallelujah. I titled this message this morning, Moving Forward 2020. Now, I, 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 if you've been in church for any amount of time, you've probably heard a moving forward message. Um, you hear them a lot in, in, in the beginnings of the new year, right? Uh, talking about moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. Um, it's, it's kind of like one of those Christian cliche sayings. Oh, we're moving forward. There's a song, right? We're moving forward. It's an awesome song. Um, it's one of those sayings that you hear if you've been in church for any amount of time, that we always have to continually move forward, right, in Christ. We always continually have to move forward. And that's kind of true in anything that we do. If we want to, if we want to excel in anything, we have to move forward, right? Um, there's another thing. There's another saying in Christianity that that we 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 use a lot, and that's called backsliding, right? Uh, moving forward and backsliding. We don't ever really hear anybody talk about in Christianity about staying exactly where you are, right? Because in in, in Christianity, there's no such thing as staying where you are. See, it says in the it says in the word that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. So when you are advancing, you're moving, right? You're constantly moving. You can't, you can't stay still and advance. You can't do it. It's, 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 it's not possible because if you're advancing, you're moving, right? You are advancing forward. You are moving forward. And so as Christians, we don't hear the saying, oh, well, I'm going to uh, stay exactly where I am in 2020. I'm going to end uh, 2020, exactly the place that I ended in 1990, I mean, 1990, golly, in 20, some of y'all are like, I wasn't even born in 1999. Uh, I'm going, I'm going, we don't, we don't say that we're going to end 2020 the same way that we, we ended 2019, right? Does anybody say that in any, any facet of your life? How many of y'all have already set New Year's resolutions to lose weight? Right? It's not even New Year's yet, but you're like, I know what I'm doing in three days. I'm setting my New Year's resolution. But you don't plan, like, you don't set that New Year's resolution in, in the end of uh, 2019 and hope that at the end of 2020, you're exactly the same place you were. You, you buy all the fitness equipment. Some of y'all probably got uh, the, 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 what's the, the, the bike, the Peloton. Any of y'all got Pelotons? Can't afford the Pelotons. You know? You just tape a TV onto the bike rack and you just go at it, man. You just go. It's called FaceTime or something. But 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 you 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 see, obviously they know they know people. We 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 people set goals. People want to have purpose. People want to have passion. People want to move forward. It's in our nature to be better than what we are. We we look at our situation and we sit there and we say, okay, I, what do I need to change? And and as Christians. We, we, we have to be the same way. We have to continually move forward. But oftentimes, every year, we set that goal. You know what? I'm going to move forward in my Christian walk. But none of us ever set and say, you know what? I'm going to move backwards this year. Like, I definitely don't want to be as good as I was. Like, I'm going to, you know, no one says that. No one says, hey, um, I think I'm going to backslide this year. 
That's my goal. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to plan. It doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. It happens, but it doesn't happen like that. Um, Christianity, uh, we always continually, Christians always have to move forward. See, Christianity is kind of like a greased pole. You know how they, during, during Mardi Gras, they grease the poles in Mardi Gras? They, they grease all of those poles to keep the crazy people, the inebriated people, or just the crazy people from climbing up the poles. So, so, so the police or whoever it is, I don't know if it's sanitation. So uh, Mardi Gras, if you don't know, they go, to, they go out into the French Quarter and they, they put Vaseline or they put whatever all over these poles to keep people from climbing up the poles. Christianity is like that. If you ever try to climb a pole, a grease pole, if you ever stop for a moment, you go back down. The only way to climb a grease pole is to constantly be working and to constantly be going up. They still climb those poles. I don't know how they do it. They have a lot of uh, passion when they want to get up those poles. They just keep going, keep going. But as soon as you stop, that's how Christianity is. As soon as you stop striving to move forward, you're moving backwards. Because remember, the kingdom is forcefully advancing. So if we're not moving with it, we're moving backwards. The kingdom's here. And if we're not moving with it and we stay still, the kingdom, and all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're further back than where we were. And so as Christians, we constantly, constantly have to strive to, to move forward in Christ. Now, how do we do that? What do we have to do? What do we have to do to move forward in, 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 in Christ? What does that even mean? What does it even mean to move forward in Christ? Well, first off, we need to know, first and foremost, if we are in Christ. How do we move forward in Christ? We need to know that we are in Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I'm only going to share a few scriptures with y'all. I don't have a whole lot of scriptures today, um, but the ones I do have are super important. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life now I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So this scripture is pretty straightforward. It's saying that I am crucified with Christ. We all know if you're a Christian, if you've been around for any amount of time, that Christ died on the cross for us. He was crucified for us. And so when Paul tells the Galatian church that, hey, I am crucified with Christ, that is powerful, powerful language. Because the church at this time knew what crucified meant. See, I don't think we can really have any earthly idea uh, what crucifixion. I mean, we, we, we as a country very rarely execute anyone anymore, right? I mean, I know Louisiana still has a death penalty. Um, Texas still has a death penalty. A couple states still. But, but as a country, we don't really, we don't really do it. And, and we, we, the reasons we don't do it is because we have a difficult time to find a way to do it uh, humanely, Right? Not because that, that people don't necessarily deserve it in the eyes of the state or different things, but, but we have a difficult time to figure out a way to how do we humanely take a life. We can't really humanely take a life. So that's why, that's why we don't, you don't see it happen very often. But the church of Galatia knew what it meant to be crucified. The Romans did not care about hum- humanely taking a life. They wanted to take a life, and they wanted it to be gruesome, and they wanted it to be gory, and they wanted it to hurt, and they wanted everyone that on that cross to pay for what they did. And so when, when Paul says, hey, I have been crucified with Christ, they knew that Paul's talking about going through something that, that he is saying that, you know what, I'm going to take my life, and I'm going to nail it up on the cross. Paul knew, and the Galatian church knew, what Paul was talking about was not an easy thing to do. Because to be crucified was not like it would be today to say, you know what, I'm going to take a nap, and I'm never going to wake up again. That's what it's like to be executed today. They're going to give me a shot in my arm. I'm going to feel a prick. How many of y'all like to get flu shots? Any of y'all like afraid of needles, right? Anybody afraid of needles? I know there's got to be people afraid of needles in there, right? Okay. Like, I don't like getting shots. I got to, like, turn away, okay? Um, so, but that's, that's, that's the extent of an execution today. That's what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to get a shot, you go to sleep, and you never wake up. And, and the bad thing is, is so many Christians live their life like they're getting a little shot, 
And that's what, but what being crucified is, is that, that it's just going to be a small little inconvenience of how I'm going to have to live my life for Christ. Well, if we go back to what Paul is talking about, about being crucified with Christ, that's a whole different ballgame. That's a whole different way of living. That's a whole different... See, Paul, Paul watched, I'm sure he watched and he saw what, a, what, a, what, a, what someone being crucified looked like. He knew the pain. He saw the pain. He saw what it was like for them to be drugged, and he saw what it, what it was like for them to be nailed on the cross on the ground and then be stood up and them to be, to be trying to gain breath and trying to, to hang on to life for hours on end until either, either their body quit on them or they just you know, had to finish it, break the legs, and they had to suffocate to death. Paul knew what it was like. You see, us as Christians... We kind of we kind of take that whole I'm going to crucify myself, meaning like you know what I'm not going to do necessarily the things I kind of want to do. But that's not the stuff Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about killing everything of what he was and who he was to live for someone else. To live for someone else, not not to live for what Paul wanted to live for, but to live what Christ died for, and what Christ lived for. He says, the life I now live in my body. So he's saying, hey, you know what? I'm here. I have to live this life. Guess what? The life that you are given, you have to live it. I cannot live it for you. I cannot live the situations. I cannot live your, your the things that you go through are not going to be the things that I go through. The, thing that, the things that, the decisions that you make in your life, you're going to have to pay for them. I'm not going to have to pay for them. You're going to have to pay for them. Just like Paul said, hey, you know what? All the things that I've done in my life, all the things that I did, I'm going to have to pay for. I'm going to have to live my life in this body. But now the difference is I'm going to crucify everything that I want and everything that I need, and I'm going to give it, and I'm going to uh, live it by faith in the Son of God who died for me. So that's, that's what a Christian is, someone who will sacrifice and crucify themselves and say, you know what, I'm going to live for Christ. Um, and even in Galatians 5.24, we see again, it says those who belong to Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I love the way Paul says this because he states it as a fact. He doesn't say, hey, they kind of. Paul just straight up says, hey, those who belong to Christ have crucified their flesh along with its passions and desires. Period. No question mark, no parentheses. He says, those who call themselves Christians have crucified themselves, their passions, and their desires. That is a fact that Paul is stating to the Galatian church. You talk about a hard message to the Galatian church. He's saying, hey, unless you have crucified yourself and your passions, oh, I don't know if I'd call you a Christian. That's a hard, hard, hard message that Paul was talking. So, so how do we move forward? First off, how do we move forward? What do we have to do? We have to accept this, this fact that have I crucified myself? Have I taken my passions? Have I, have I taken my desires? I'm not saying that you can't have passions, and I'm not saying you can't have desires, not, you can't, have, uh, can't ho have those things, but have you given them to the Lord and said, God, you first, me second? God, your agenda first, mine last. Have we done that? Because we cannot move forward in Christ until you've done that. Because God says, okay, you move forward on your own. You see, we can try and we can try and we can try to have a good relationship and to grow in Christ. But if, his, if our agenda is above his, we'll never grow in Christ. We may grow in knowledge. We may grow in wisdom. You may grow in stature. You may come to church. You may sit in the pew. You may be, you may be a, a leader. You may, you may have all the wisdom. You may be able to teach. You may be able to do this. But until you set yourself aside and saying, God, you first, we'll never move forward in Christ. We'll never move forward. And that's, a, that's hard to say because we sit there and we can judge by what we know. Uh, I read the Bible three times this year. How can I not be moving forward in Christ? But unless his agenda is first, unless we crucify ourselves, unless we crucify our passions and our desires. And, it, and, and, it, and it's easy to say, and I'm, and I'm not talking about church. 
I'm not saying that if you wanted to go see a Saints game on Sunday and set up and miss one church, I'm not saying that 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 you're going to go to hell. I'm not saying that. I'm not. I'm church is not Christ. I think you have to be be. Uh, uh, I think you have to be steady. I think that you should be tithing. I think that you should be coming to church. I think that you should belong to a group. I think you should do all of those things. But that's not necessarily, that, 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 that is fruit of your relationship with Christ. That is the fruit of your relationship with Christ. Are you seeking God? Are you saying, God, I want to move forward with you? And using the church as an avenue to do that. Using the church as a vehicle to be able to move you forward in Christ. And as a church... And as pastors and as leaders here, are we equipping you to move forward in Christ? That's, see, that's our job. That's the church's job. Are we equipping you to move forward in Christ? But you have to move forward. I can drag you and I can pull you and I can say, please come with me. We, let's move forward together. It does not work. Ask anybody who's been in leadership. Ask anybody who's been a Christian. Ask anybody with a lost loved one. You cannot drag them and, uh, kicking and screaming into the kingdom. It has to be a decision that has to be made by them. So it's a fact that we have to crucify ourselves. We have to crucify our passions. Um, in Luke chapter 9, we have to be fit to serve Christ. So before we move forward, we have to be fit to serve Christ. In Luke 9, ver, uh, chapter 9, verse 62, this is a very hard scripture. It's in red letter. This is Jesus speaking to a man. Jesus replies, he says, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Now, that is a hard scripture. That he's saying that no one, looks, no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom. No one who looks back at, 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 at uh, what they're leaving is fit for the kingdom. Now, some backstory on this. This is, this is a man who said he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, well, come, come follow me. And the guy said, but first, before I follow you, I have to go home. And I have to tell my parents and my children and my, my family, and I have to tell them all that I'm leaving so that I could follow you. And, then, and this is what Jesus' reply was. So what Jesus was telling him, he's saying, hey, look, if you go back, if you go back and tell your parents, if you go back and tell your family that you're laying it all down for me, if you're laying it all down, he, Jesus knew what would happen. Jesus was not telling them, hey, forget your father, get, forget your mother. and just he, he, wasn't, he was telling them that, hey, you need to protect who you are in Christ because if you go back to your family, they're going to tell you you're crazy and they're going to tell you that you shouldn't do it, that you have too much to lose to give up everything and follow that man, Jesus. Jesus knew what would happen if he went back. So Jesus was trying to protect him from himself because oftentimes we look and we want to move forward with God, but we look back and say, hey, what do you all think about it? What, 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 what if God is calling me to do this? What, what do you think about it? And, and we look back and we look back at, at, at our life and we look back at what the decisions we've made and we look back and we let all those things, all those past hurts, all those past desires, all those bad decisions we've made, and, and we look back and it rips us from the passion. It rips us from God's purpose in our life. So that's why he's saying anybody who looks back isn't fit. Not because uh, if you look back, you're going to be forgotten. Because if we look back, we're not looking forward. If we look back, we're not looking forward. If we're trying to find someone else's uh, uh, approval instead of Christ's approval, we can never move forward. We have to find our hope. We have to find our future in Christ. You cannot find your future. See, you can come and you it, it, getting my approval is nothing because I don't get you into heaven. I don't get you saved. Getting, get, you know, getting, get, it doesn't happen. We have, to, we have to find out what God has for us, his plan, his purpose, and we have to move forward with it. And, and no matter what the cost, no matter how, what people say, no matter what, what the, the tug on our heart would be, there's a lot of people in here right now that you know that you have a calling on your life and you have a purpose on your life but you're too afraid to go after it because of what you pe think people will think. You're too afraid to go after it because of, you're, you're afraid to fail. You're afraid to go after it because someone told you that you couldn't do it. And God is tugging and pulling and calling every single year, every single day, every single month. He's trying to pull you and, and, and take you to a situation that you're not 
comfortable with. But yet we sit that sit and we say, you know what? I tried it once and it didn't work out. Or I tried it before and it didn't really happen. Or I've given God, I've given him a chance and it didn't, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Those are the kind of things that stop you from moving forward. So you can't look back at the previous failures. You can't look back and try to seek other people's approval for moving forward in God. It's it's all about you and him. You and him. So we have to continually go. And so what are, what are the things? We have to be sold out. We have to be fit to serve Christ. And I've shared this story before. Um, uh, when I, when I, was, I grew up in church, so, so from, the, from the age of three or two or whatever, my mom got saved when I was two, and so we started coming to church when I was two years old. So I went through children's church. I went and did the youth thing. I went and did Sunday services. I went to the conferences. We would, you know, I was drugged to church on Sundays. All the things that some of you have been done. But it wasn't until 19 that I really gave my heart uh, to the Lord. And at 19, I said, okay, you know what? I'm not looking back anymore. Because before that, I'd come in, I'd get saved, I'd feel a little bit of the Holy Ghost uh, goosebumps like Cody talked about, right? And then I'd go back and I'd look back. I'd look back at everything I was leaving behind. And guess what? He would take what God had given me just for that moment. And I'd be sucked right back into the world. And it was something that, it wasn't that the world was doing it to me. I was doing it to myself. See, we sit there and say, oh, it's so hard to live for Christ. Really, it's, it's just about us choosing not to live for Christ. Because the world has, the, 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 the world may have some, some grip on me or the world may have some grip on you and be tugging at you, but whose decision is it to turn back? I mean, whose decision really is it to be mediocre for Christ? So here I am. 17, 18, you know, 16, going to youth, going to camps, going to children's church, getting, you know, touched by the Holy Spirit, had a calling on my life, 13 years old. I I remember being uh, 13 or 14 years old, and we were on vacation in northern Louisiana. We went to this old Assembly of God church. The power of God was moving in one of those old AG churches, right? And uh, I remember going up to the altar and uh, God just hitting me, right? like 13 years old, hitting me and, and just and laying face down on the altar and out, out. And then three hours later, I'm up, I mean, church is empty. It's the pastor and my mom in the back, just sitting there, twiddling thumbs. No music, nothing. It was like Tom just went away. I tried to get up. So what happens when you're on your knees for three hours, right? You try to get up, you just kind of crumble. See, so that's 13 years old. Had an experience with God that really should have, should have changed my life at that point. But you know what? It didn't. God was pulling me, pulling me, pulling me. I chose not to move forward. I chose not to move forward. Fast forward. 19 years old got saved. And I made a decision, God, I am not turning back. God, I'm not moving. I'm not going back. I'm not going to choose the things that make me unfit for the service of you. See, it was my decision. It wasn't the world. It wasn't my friends. It wasn't if I, I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. It wasn't my girlfriend or it wasn't anybody else. It was Jared's decision not to choose, not to go forward. And so when we, when we can take uh, ownership of our decisions, it kind of makes things a little bit easier when we can take ownership of who we are in Christ. And when we can say, well, God, why am I not moving forward? So you have to make the decision. You have to be sold out. You have to uh, have that fact that, God, I will lay down my passions. I will lay down my desires. Now, there are things that will hold you back. There are things that will hold you back. Fear and doubt can hold you back. You may be afraid of what's going on. We're not really going to focus on fear and doubt too much today. But fear and doubt can hold you back. Afraid of where God's going to bring you. Afraid of God, what God's going to uh, have you do. Pastor Derek shares all the time about if he knew that he was going to be preaching when he got saved, he probably would have never, because that fear and that doubt would have held him back because he was so afraid 
to, to be able to speak into a crowd. So that fear and that doubt could have easily held our senior pastor back from, from being who he's called to be in Christ. So fear and doubt, fear of, fear of failure, fear of, of, God, where are you going to bring me? Some of you may be called to missions, but you're afraid to go. I recently heard someone who said, who said they've, they've uh, booked two mission trips, paid for two mission trips, right? And they go, and they feel like they're called to missions, but they're afraid to fly, and he's missed two missions trips because when, it tom- when, it, when the time to get on the plane came, he couldn't do it. That is, that, is, that is a hard and sad situation. And he knows. He says, oh, I have to battle this thing. I know it is hindering me, my walk with God because I'm afraid to get on a plane. Could you imagine being called to do it, but you just couldn't get there because fear had you bound? See, fear and doubt can stop you from moving forward. Uh, selfish desires. And this is one of the ones we're going to talk about today. Is selfish desires can stop you from moving forward. So, uh, what is what is your purpose and what is your what is your uh, purpose and what is your passion? You see, so many of us we get saved and we go through our Christian walk and we focus on 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 our own agendas. We get saved and the only thing that changes is that we're redeemed by the blood, right? We get, we come up here, our heart gets changed, our lives get changed, but our future. And our focus on who we are stays exactly the same. And I don't think, I don't really believe that, that, that God would redeem you, set you free, and not give you plan and purpose. I just, I, I just cannot believe that God does that. He does not do that. He does not set you free and say, okay, thank you for existing. Now you exist in me. He doesn't do that. He has a plan and he has a purpose for every single person. He, he has a plan and a purpose that you will glorify him in everything that you do and everything that you will do. But there's too many Christians today. There are Christians here in this room. There are Christians here out, outside of that room. Um, and we expect to find purpose in God's provision. It says, no, I wrote down, he says, we will not find purpose in God's provision and promises. You can live in the provision of God, and you can live uh, in the promises of God, and you can have a great life in the, in, in the provision and promise of God, but you will not find your purpose in that. The only place you find your purpose in God is in his plan and his, and his, and his vision for your life. You're not going to find it in the promises. It's great to have all the promises of God. It's, it's great to know that, that, that he will show up when we need him to, that he will... He will save our loved ones, that he will do all the things that he promises us that he will do in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. It's awesome to have the provision to to sit there and say and know that we're covered. But but that is not where we're going to find our purpose. We're going to find our purpose in his plan for you. There's a difference. His promises and his provisions are not his plan. He has a specific plan and a purpose for you. And you need to find that, and you need to, to go after that, and you need to seek that. And how do we do that? In Jeremiah 29, 11, I know that's Pastor Bonnie's favorite scripture. It says that I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So God doesn't just get us saved without a plan. But oftentimes I think we live our life and we say, okay, God, here I am. I'm going to church. I'm writing my check, I'm writing my tithe check, I'm going to life group, I'm praying, I'm reading my word, but we never seek out his plan and his purpose. So we're just, a, and, and, and it's a shame because he has a plan and he has a purpose for you, to prosper you. He has a future for you. Some of you sit here and say, some of you may be sitting here and saying, God, I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know, God, what God has for me. I don't know what his future has for me. And you're perfectly okay with that. And God doesn't want you to be perfectly okay with that. God wants you to seek what he has for you. It's the only way to move forward. You need to seek what he has for you. He has a plan and he has a purpose. We need to be able to seek it. We need to be able to go after it. Um, But sometimes our own selfish ambitions, sometimes our own selfish desires get in the way. It's not what we're planning to do.
Do I have that on there? Yeah, no, okay. It wasn't on my notes. It says, it's not what you are planning to do with God, but what God is planning to do with you. See, so, so many of us say, okay, well, well, you know what? I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And we give God a checklist of what we want to do. God, I want to be this. God, I want to be like this guy. God, I want to be like David Hogan. Or God, I want to be like this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this. And we make this big old list of, of, of what we want to do with God. And God's list may be completely different than our own. And then we have to choose. We have to choose. What, God, I want to be a preacher. No, I don't want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a teacher. But God, I want to be a preacher. I don't want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a teacher. But God, I want to be a preacher. I do not want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a teacher. And, we, and some of us live our entire Christian lives arguing with God about what I want to be and what I want to do. And we never find joy. We never find fulfillment. And we never find purpose. And it's not because God doesn't have it for us, but, but we are in our own way. We are in, you're in your own way. You're saying, God, no, I want to do this. No, I don't want you to do this. I want you to do this. And if you ask, again, you can sit down with Pastor Derek because he, he talks about it so often that, that his, his plan was not to be a preacher. His plan was not to be a preacher. That was God's plan. And if you ask him today, are you fulfilled? Or you feel like you're living out your purpose? I'm sure he would absolutely say, yes, absolutely. Why? Because he didn't choose Derek's plan. He choose, chose God's plan. So God has a plan for you, but we have to get, of our, get, our, get out of our own way. Sometimes our own selfish desires. And they could be really good desires. We, 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 we sit there and we say, well, it's not like I want to be a multimillionaire and I'm trying to, to live this life. I just, I just would love to just be a missionary. I think it would be cool to be a missionary. But God didn't call you to be a missionary. Maybe God called you to be a giver. Maybe God gave you, called you to be compassionate, to be a listener. You will find your purpose if you sit there and seek your purpose. But you got to be willing to yield to what God has for you. You have to be willing to say, God, whatever you have for me, I'll, I'll take it. Your vision, your vision can mess you up. The way we see things can mess us up. Proverbs 29 uh, 10. You'll hear this scripture a lot. Um, ooh, that is not the scripture. Hold on. That is not the scripture. Dog it. That's my fault because I think I wrote Proverbs 29 because I got it on my paper too, but that's not it. Want to give me two seconds? Google is your friend. Can you put up Proverbs 29, 18? It's amazing. You just put, instead of a one zero, you, you know, you don't put the, the little circle. 29, 18, not 29, 10. I'm going to need it in New King James and in NIV. I'm putting them on the spot. This is the NIV. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instructions. Now, you'll hear this, you'll hear this scripture, but it'll be very recognizable in New King James. Put, put it in New King James and then go back to NIV. Can you put it in New King James? I'm working on That's why you proofread people. <laughs> it says, where there is no revelation, the people can't. Okay, I, I, maybe I meant King James. But King James says... Where there is no vision, the people perish. You hear that preached a lot. You hear that preached a lot when people want to cast vision for church. But that's not real. You can leave that one on. But it's saying this is more personal. This is on a more personal level. This is not a kingdom. This is, this is not about church. This is about, let's take this personal. Where there is no revelation, the people cost, uh, cast off restraint. When you don't have revelation for your life, you're just going to be lost in the wind. You're just going to be floating around as a Christian with no purpose, no plan. You're just going to be going through the motions. As a, as, a, as a Christian that goes through the motions, 
you're not going to, you're not going to, God is not going to be able to, to use you for his glory. God is not going to be able to use you the way he wants to use you. Until you have revelation for what God has for you, until you have revelation for, 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 for what you need to do for God, he, he's not going to be able to use you the way he wants to use you. It says the people cast off restraint. What does that mean? That means they just run free. They do whatever it is that they want to do. And Christians are not supposed to do whatever it is they want to do. I don't know if, if, if anybody's ever told you that, but as a Christian, you're not supposed to be doing whatever it is that you want to do. As a Christian, you're supposed to be doing whatever it is he wants you to do. That's the big difference. But, but Christians today, we, we tend to say, you know what, as long as I follow these rules, and as long as I follow this, then I can do whatever it is I want to do, if, as long as I stay within the parameters of being a Christian. That's not true. It's definitely not true in a victorious life. It's definitely not true in a life that's going to give God glory. As a Christian, if you want to move forward, you need to have revelation for what God has for you. You need to have vision for what God has for you. you got to have that, 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 that calling. you got to know that you know that this is what I'm supposed to do. Without any reserve, doesn't matter what anybody else tells you, you need to know this is God's plan for me. If you ever seen somebody with passion that, that no matter what they tell, whatever, no matter what anybody tells them, he's like, no. I love watching, um, you know, videos of, of, of disciplined kids or, or disciplined athletes. You ever watch disciplined athletes and they do things um, that nobody else uh, was thought possible? Anybody ever watch that kicker um, that the Patriots just signed on YouTube? Y'all ever seen it? Somebody had to see him. They just signed him. He's a, he's a trick field goal kicker, right? And you watch this kid, and he takes it. Nobody's seen this video. You need to go check this out. He takes these the, 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 the footballs, and it, he kicked like a 75-yard field goal. It's crazy. So he takes, these, he takes these things, and he does like soccer moves. He kicks the field goal up and does like a spinning back kick or something and kicks like a 50-yard field goal. And he does all these crazy things. And you're just like, what, what kind of discipline? Like, like what, what, what does it take? And, 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 and they just constantly, they're, they're pushed to the limits. And, and, and nothing can stop them. When you have a plan and a purpose, nothing can stop you. When you know God's revelation for your life, there is nothing that can stop you. No, nobody can tell you. Nobody could tell that kid, hey, you're not going to be able to kick. There's no way you're going to be able to kick a 75-year-old field goal. He says, watch me. Why? Because he knows he has a plan, he has a purpose, he has passion for what he's doing. And so when we can receive that from God and we can receive his plan, we can receive his purpose, there will not, nothing will be able to stop you from moving forward. Um, when we have a lack of vision in Christianity, uh, it's, it's like when someone calls a mechanic. Anybody ever, anybody ever have any car trouble? You call a mechanic. Like I've called, I've called my mechanic. I say, hey, something's wrong with my car. He said, well, what's wrong with it? It's making a noise. I know all y'all have been here. It's making a noise. What noise is making? And then we sit there and we try. But, well, it's like a clunk. What do you mean a clunk? Is it a deep clunk? Like the mechanic knows, like, the difference between a deep clunk and a light clunk and a hard clunk. And, you're like, and so you try to replicate. No, it's like a boop, 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 boop. He's like, no, I don't understand what that means. He's like, well, it, it, it's like a boop, 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 boop. No, 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 no. You got to be more specific. Like, how can I be more specific? I'm telling you what, exactly what it sounds like. But lack of vision is like you calling the mechanic, and you're on the phone with your mechanic, and you sit there and say, hey, something's wrong with my car. So what's the mechanic going to say? He's going to say, okay, well, what, 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 the first thing he says is, well, what is your car doing? You say, well, it's not moving. My car's not moving. He said, well, okay, what do you mean is it not moving? Is it starting? Absolutely, it, it, it starts. He says, okay, well, let's start from there. So when you get in the car and you, you put the key in and, and you turn it over, does it start? He's like, yes, it starts right away. So the mechanic says, okay, well, the car is starting. He says, okay, well, when you give it gas, does it, the engine rev up? Yes, the engine revs up. Okay, well, what else is it doing? What do you mean it's not moving? Well, I get in the car. I put it in drive. I can feel that the transmission moves in the drive. So the you know, mechanic's thinking transmission problem, whatever. He's like, no, I put the car in drive. I hear it clunk. The wheels are spinning and everything, I'm just not moving anywhere. So the mechanic says, geez, I don't understand what's going on. He's like, look, you gotta be able to tell me what's wrong with my car. And, and then you tell the mechanic, did I tell you, did I mention that it's a 2019? 
It's a brand new car. I just got it. So now the mechanic's even more confused, right? And, you, and, and the person's saying, I don't know what's wrong with this car. I get in this car. I start it up. It starts up fine. The horns work. The radio works. The light works. The brake light works. Everything works. The wheel spin when I put it in drive, it just won't go anywhere. So the mechanic says, you know what? I can't do this over the phone. I need to come to you. Can you bring me the car? I can't drive the car anyway. You need to come to me. So the mechanic gets in his car, drives to this person's house, gets out of the car, sees the car, and immediately knows what's wrong with the vehicle. Immediately, by seeing the vehicle, sees what's wrong with the vehicle. Guy runs out and says, thank God you're here. Can you tell me what's wrong with my vehicle? The mechanic says, yeah, stupid. You're stuck in the mud. That's how Christians are with no vision. That's how Christians are with no vision. Everything's working. You're reading your Bible. You're, you're coming to church. You're doing everything you're supposed to be, everything you're supposed to be doing, but you're sitting there saying, God, why can't I get through this valley? God, why can't I get through this funk that, I am, that I'm in? Why can't I get out of where I have been and go where I know you've called me to do to go? It's because we, 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 we don't have any vision to see the problem. We don't have any vision to see where we're supposed to be going. And so, so we have this perfectly operating vehicle, but nowhere to go, no vision to see. Sometimes we need people to show us, and to, sometimes we need people to help us see the vision for us in our lives, to see what God has for you in your life. That's what this message is about. It's not to give you vision. It's for you to sit there and say, golly, I need a vision. I need a purpose. I need a plan. Sometimes we need to be able to seek the counsel of others. Sometimes we need to be able to, sometimes we need somebody to say, hey, dummy, you're stuck in the mud. You're spinning your tires. You're going to be this, in the same place as you are now, a year from now, unless you get vision. Unless you are able to see what is holding you back. You see, that, that person who owned that car obviously was not looking in the right place. He was looking at everything inside, but he was not looking at what was really stopping him from moving forward. See, if he would have just gotten out and opened up his eyes instead of looking at everything that he was and everything else, but to kind of look out and see and to, to, to broaden his vision and to sit there and say, God, maybe there's some other lining circumstances that are holding me back. Maybe be there's some circumstances in your life that are holding you back from being who God's called you to be. Maybe you're stuck in the mud. Maybe it's just you having to get out and saying, hey, this is what I have to do to lay down my selfish desires, to lay down, uh, to, 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 be able to sit there and say, God, whatever it is that you have for me, I want it. I'm going to take it. We need to be able to, to see what God has for us. We need to have vision. We need counsel sometimes. Proverbs 11:14 14 says, for lack of guiding, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. We, sometimes we need, to, we need to get advice. Sometimes you need to find somebody. Sometimes, you, look, if you don't have somebody that you're talking to, if you don't have a group, if you don't have somebody that can help, help uh, you see that you're stuck in the mud, sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes you have to get with people. There are people here that, that want to have a relationship with you. You have to have advisors. You, you have to seek counsel. And that's what we're here for a church. That's why we're here. That's why we do the things that we do. We don't, we don't come... Uh, and, and have life groups every single week because we just love going out and, and on, a, on a Tuesday night and hearing everybody's problem. Well, no, we want to help people see vision. We want to help people advance in the kingdom. We want to see people move forward. Sometimes we need to have that. Isaiah, there's another, another very popular scripture, Isaiah uh, 43 and 19. says, I'm doing a new thing now. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, God's doing a new thing, but if we can't perceive it and if we can't see it, then what's the point? What's the point? If you have that two brand new car and it's stuck in the mud and you can't see that it's stuck in the mud, what's the point of having a new car? Because it will never go anywhere. It will never do what it was created to do. It will never bring you anywhere. We have to be able to see it. We have to be able to perceive that God has something for us, that God has a purpose for us. God has a passion. For, uh, God wants us to live with passion. God wants us to move forward in Christ. So I'm, I'm going to end with Mark 12, 41 through 44. 
It says that Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. It says, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had to live on. So here we see Jesus talking about this woman putting in everything that she had to live on. And the funny thing about the scriptures, it's also in uh, Luke. Luke tells a the very similar story about this woman who put in everything that she had to live on. So how do we move forward? We really need to look at this woman. And, and Jesus looked at her in amazement. I, I don't know about you, but I'd love for Jesus to look at me in amazement and say, hey, that, that person is who you need to watch. I'd love Jesus to sit there on his throne or wherever he hangs out, right, and to sit down and say, hey, see that guy? See what he just did? That's who you need to watch. Because she gave, she didn't give out of her wealth, but she gave out of her, out of her poverty. I believe that God wants us to do th to, uh, a couple of things. I think he wants, uh, wants us to offer God, we need to offer God our first. If you want to move forward in Christ, you need to offer God your first. And what is your first? You got to offer him your first love. You got to offer him your first tithe, your first money, your belongings. And you got to offer him your first time. Time, money, and love. Those are just three of the things I wrote down. But we got to give him our first. Give him the best of who you are. Give him the best of who you are. You got to give God your best. That means if you're a singer, you need to sing. If you're a giver, you need to give. If you have talents, you need to give those talents. You got to give God your best. Don't give him your second best. You want to move forward, say, God, this is what I have to offer. You can have it. This is what I have to offer. You can have it. And the last thing, if you want to move forward, is you got to give God your future. The future is the tricky one because those are the things that we don't know about. But we have to give him our future. Those are the things that he has laid up for us, that he has waiting for us. See, some of you are sitting here and saying, I don't have anything to offer. God has something for you to offer. Maybe it's, maybe it's laid up. Maybe he's waiting for you to just get to the point where you can use it. But we're sitting there spinning our wheels and not moving anywhere and not going forward. Maybe you're just one step away. Maybe you're just one step away from giving God something that he has been waiting to give you so that you can give it back to him. One step away. One step away. Yesterday, I, again, I was, uh, you know, just scrolling through, and I saw uh, my kids watch those silly YouTube videos. You know, anybody have kids that are 9 and 10, they watch stupid YouTube videos all day long, right? So my kids were watching a YouTube video, and they were talking about sports blunders. And he had this guy, and he's, and, he, and, he's, and he's on a bike, and he's in a race. And he's, and, he, and he's, 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 I mean, he's pumping, right? And they're filming. I guess, you know how they have the, the motorcycle or moped in front of him, and, and, he's, and, he's, and he's watching, 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 watching. And he's looking behind him, right? He's looking behind him, and he's looking behind him. And, and, and he, he's, he's, you know, 10 bike lengths in front. And he starts pumping his fists in the air, and he's like, yeah. And he's, he's all pumped because he's, he's going to win this race, right? He's pumped, completely oblivious, and people are yelling at him, and they're doing this. They're saying, you got one more lap. You got one more lap, and he's pumped. Yeah. And he's so excited. And, he, and you know how they come up, and then they just start doing this number, riding with no hands. And, they, and, and the people are behind him or focused ahead, and they're just head down, and people are going, one more lap, dude, you got one more lap. Don't stop, don't quit, don't quit. He had one more lap to go. But in, in his mind, he was finished. He was done. He thought he had won. And so he, he's just, and then, boom, boom, people are just, and he's complete. He, he, he was, his vision, he didn't even, 
there was no shock. There was no awe because, because his vision was so blinded by the fact that he thought he was done that everybody passed him up. And he, it, it, you didn't even get to see his face that he real, what happened when he real, because he, he was just like so relieved. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. And then everybody in the race, shoo, 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 just passes him up. And of course, I didn't get to see how the video ended. But could you imagine the heartache? Could you imagine all of the things that he had to do? All of the things he had to work for to maybe even qualify for this race. The, the stuff he had to lay down in his life to make him obviously good enough to win the race. He was in the lead. He had, he had lengths in front of him. Everything was going his way. But he took off. He, he just lost the vision of where he was going. See, he was perfectly qualified. He had everything he needed to win. He was winning the race. He was running and he was moving forward and everything was great, but he lost sight of where he was going. It didn't take away from how good of a cyclist he was. When he, when he lost that race, people didn't look back and say, well, you know, he just didn't train hard enough. They didn't look back and say, well, maybe next year he just wasn't good enough. He didn't look, the people didn't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, his, he, he caught a flat. Man, it's a bad break. You know what they did when they, when they probably talked about it? You know what? He just took his eyes off the, off the finish line. He took, he, took his lines off, he took his eyes off the future. Perfectly qualified. He, can, he, can, he, he might win the next 15 races, but he lost that one because he took his eyes off of where he was going. And as Christians, you can lose out for what God has for you and your purpose in your life, and you can reach the finish line and never fulfill the purpose that God has for you. Perfectly qualified, perfectly equipped to win what God has for you to win, perfectly uh, ready, but because of vision or because of, of taking our eyes off the cross or taking our eyes off the, off the vision line or because of our own fear or our own doubt or our own selfish desires, we take our eyes off of what God has for us and we lose the race. We may get in. We may get in. We may get into heaven, but you know what? I believe that God has a storeroom of gifts for us. I think that when we get in, he's going to be able to show us. What I don't want to happen is for me to get into heaven and him, him say, hey, man, good job. You did great. You did awesome. And, and me to ask a question because I'm, I, I just, hey, well, what did I miss? And then him just to have something. You know, I don't know if he would play something for me. Maybe he would Maybe he would have faces. Whatever. My, my greatest fear is to go up there and say, hey, Man, look, look, these are all the people that you helped influence, right? Let's just say this right side. Let's, let's say this side right here. I get up and I see all my familiar faces in heaven. Oh, man, I witnessed to this guy on the street. Oh, oh, there's Cliff and Rachel. Yeah, we were really close friends. Oh, there's Brady. You know, he was with me thick and thin. You know, oh, oh, there's, and I see all of these people that, that I helped influence into the kingdom. And God's like, you did an awesome job. I say, well, God, man, God, what about these people? What about these people? You see, those are the ones that you missed. Because you didn't have your eyes fixed on me the whole time. Those are the ones you missed. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. But I don't want it to happen. And I say, well, I don't remember him. I don't, re I don't remember this guy. I don't ever, God, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because I'm going to get defensive, right? I don't know if I'm going to get defensive in heaven, but I, right now I'd get defensive. I'd be like, well, God, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to argue with you right here. I don't remember him. So I didn't miss him. He says, oh, he was there. Your eyes were on something else. You didn't see him. Your vision was on yourself and not on me. You didn't see him. But God, wait a minute. I, I, I I thought I lived a, 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 a Christian walk. He's like, you lived it, but you missed it. You missed out on my plan. You missed out on my purpose. You might have got partial parts of it, but you didn't get everything I had for you. I don't want to miss that. I don't, I don't want to miss that. I, I don't want to miss anything. Because you know what? Like that fact in Galatians chapter 5, it says, hey, they lay down their passions. 
they lay down their own desires and they crucify themselves with Christ. It's a hard walk, but in the end, it's worth it. In the end, it's worth it. In life, it's worth it. It's worth it right now. It's worth laying down your own desires to see the glory of God. And as you go forward, I know I had a lot of just, just I was all over, I felt like I was all over the place today, but it doesn't really matter because it comes down to this. It comes down to seeking God and saying, God, I know that you have a plan and purpose for me. And I wish, I really do, that I wish I could come lay hands on you and God would tell me exactly what he has for you because I wish somebody could do it for me. But you know what? I can't. But I can tell you one thing and I can promise you one thing with everything that I am, that if you seek him and put him first and live according to his plan, you will have joy. You will have fulfillment. You will not be missing anything. You won't ever look back at your life and say, God, I missed it. Because you'll be living with desire. You'll be living with passion. And, not, and you'll finish the race with vision. And I'm just going to pray. I don't know. There's a lot of people here. Um, but God died for us. God set us free. And I know I talked a little bit about backsliding. If we're not moving forward, then we're moving backwards. And maybe that's you here this morning. Maybe you're in a situation you say, you know what? I'm in the same place today at the end of 2019 than I was in 2018. I think we need to correct that and we need to fix that so that we can be better and we can move forward in 2020 so that next Sunday that we're better than we were today. And so if that's you, every eye open, every eye open, every head up, I just want you to just slip your hand up and say, hey, that's me. That's me. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm asking you to get real with God right now in front of everybody. God, that's me. I want to be better. God, I want to be better. God, I want to move forward. God, I want to have vision. Now, keep your hands up. Now, if you're lacking vision and what God has for you, if you're saying, God, I have no idea what God wants me to do, but I know it's something. If you're sitting there and saying, God, I feel a calling in my heart. I feel an unction in my heart that God has something bigger for me than what I'm doing right now. I want you to lift your hand up. So I want you to lift your hand up. So we got hands going up everywhere. Now, if you know what's holding you back, if you know what's holding you back, I just want you to say, God, I'm going to give you this. Say it in your head. Say it in the back of your head. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say, you know, God knows. God can hear you whenever, you know. Just say, God, so-and-so is holding me back. This thing is holding me back. God, I'm going to give it to you. And what I'm going to do now, and my next one, keep everybody's hands up. That was up. My next one, how many of you want to move forward in 2020? How many of you want to be better? How many of you want to see passion? How many of you want to live a life that, that will give glory to God? Lift your hand up. So we got hands up all over the building. So now keep them up. You're going to miss it if your hands aren't up. But Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that every single hand up, every single hand up, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would come down from heaven that you would pour out your spirit on every single person here, God. Whatever reason that they have their hand up, maybe they're not where they need to be. Maybe they're lacking vision. Maybe they're lacking purpose. Or maybe they just want to move forward in you, God. Lord, I pray that you would, that you would pour out passion on them and purpose on them. And God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would put a burning desire in their bones, God, Lord, right now. Lord, that you would pour out a passion, a burning desire, God, that it's so deep within their bones that when they wake up, they need to do something for you, that they need to do something that will move them forward, that they need to, to uh, uh, have a call to action right now in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you pour out on them. Well, God, that you pour out on them right now in Jesus' name. And what I want everybody to do now, if you're a leader in the building, I want you to put your hand up. If you consider yourself a leader in the building, I want you to put your hand up. If you, if you work in any kind of our ministries or anything like that, I want you to put your hand up. Lord, right now in the name, I'm going to put my hand up too. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we end out 2019, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you give us the passion. You give us the purpose. 
Lord God, to lay down our own selfish agendas, to lay down our own selfish ideas. Lord God, to, to, to have make 2020 be all about you, God, that you would equip us, Lord God, so that we can be everything you called us to be, God, that you can pour out, Lord God, that we would see more vision and then we would, we would see more clearly the plans and the purposes that you have for us. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for the leadership of this church, Lord God, that we would just uh, be renewed in Jesus' name by the fire of the Holy Ghost. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And, and do y'all, it's 1146. Can y'all give me five more minutes? Could you do that? Five minutes? Could you, you got that video for me? After this video, we are admit that you're dismissed. But before we play that video, I was, I was praying this morning and, and uh, I was watching, praying and listening to music. And this, vi this video came on. It's from Hill Songs. It's a song. I just want you to listen to the lyrics and then we're going to just play. It says, in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. So listen to this. In the soil, I now surrender. You're breaking new ground. I believe that some of you need new ground this year. And then it says, so, so listen, listen to the words. I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't, listen to this word. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. That's somebody who lays their agenda. Make me whatever you want me to be. But all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where there is new wine, there's power. And we're going to end this service. We're going to end of the year expecting God to bring us new wine. But you know what? It starts in the ground. It starts with crushing. It starts with pressing. It starts with a hard message to say, golly, I got, I got to get my stuff together if I want to move forward. And that's me too. I got to get my stuff together if I want to see everything that God has for me. You play that? And then I'm just going to, I'm going to put the mic down when this is over.